Good evening. Hi, everybody. And thank you. Thanks so much for coming. Um, I mean, it seemed it might have been a bit of a conflict between sort of warm weather and hanging out outside and, and, and coming here. And um, so I, I'm grateful that you've come. And uh, uh, yeah, I haven't. I'm, I'm, I'm very pleased to donate a lecture to the LifeWorks Free Recovery Series. I've done that. I, I tend to sort of do one once a year. And the one that I tend to do is on adoption and addiction. Um, which is a, a particular interest of mine because adoptees are so overrepresented in, in, in treatment. But actually this year it seemed like an opportunity to do something different. And um, I guess I wanted to do it because, well, I, I think we're all fascinated in relationships, aren't we? You know, we just, we just are. They're such complicated things. And uh, so I, I guess, you know, I really wanted to, and my passion, I, I was trained as an addictions counsellor 25 years ago, so my sort of passion is sort of, what happens to people during the course of recovery? That's what really interests me. Um, you know, having, having started my training, trying to help people get into recovery right at the beginning, I then started to think about, actually, this is a fascinating journey. You know, we know a whole lot now that we just didn't know back then. We know that actually it's very rare that there's only one addiction. We know that in the course of recovery, people are going to come across all sorts of addictions. Actually, we know that most people are on a spectrum for all different addictions, whether it's the food and eating disorders, the financial addictions of gambling, spending, debting, under-earning, the sex and love addictions and all the complications that go with all of that, the work addictions, the addiction to busyness that has people managing anxiety by focusing on projects. You know, we know that this stuff comes up all the time. And um, I suppose over the course of, of my work, seeing people in the consulting room with quite mature recovery in their first fellowships, feeling really quite ashamed to be struggling with some sense of powerlessness and rather hoping that, you know, what's happening for those of you that are sort of 12-step fellowship members, rather hoping that what they're struggling with is, is what, what the 12-steppers would call a step six and seven issue, a bit of a character defect, but actually having to realise that, oh gosh, actually that I have another addiction. I'm also really interested to see in what happens to people during the course of recovery as they di hit different points in the life cycle. You know, actually a third of us can expect to get depressed and it has nothing to do with how well people work a recovery program or how committed they are. Nobody is immune. No, you know, no containing fellowship or, you know, recovery process, however people might do it, actually stops people from going through the different phases of the life cycle. You know what, we're all going to have a bit of a midlife crisis. It's just going to happen. And equally, we're all going to get into some real difficulties around relationships. You know. and, that, you know, and that, I suppose, particularly interests me. When I started my training, um, the only bit of sort of relationship work, I, it, it, 25 years ago, addiction was very much about alcohol and drugs. We didn't really know codependency. Pia Melody was starting to write her book. We didn't really know what it was. You know, the partner who turned up at the treatment centre wasn't the codependent. You know, it was Mrs. Addict. You know, it was like sort of happy families or something. It was just the, you know, and, and we would talk. And if we saw couples, you know, if, if husbands came in, wives came in, you know, other partners came in, Actually, it was all very much about, look, actually, we want you to come in because we want some information about the person that we're treating, do you know? And, uh, and, and which indeed is quite helpful because addiction is all about denial. Actually, you do need someone else who was there at the scene of crime. I'm sure you'd agree with that if you want to know what's going on. But actually, the problem is what, what we missed then was understanding that actually, if you're in the room with somebody who's an identified patient as an addict and their partner, you're in the room with two really distressed people. And I think what we particularly missed is that we're in the room with two people who have addictive processes. Robin Norwood knew this when she wrote Women Who Love Too Much, that bestseller. You know, Robin Norwood, you probably know, was an addiction um, counsellor who did all the sort of family work. And in the end, she said, God, they're all, you know, she just realised that what she was dealing with was an addiction. Mostly with the women then, and then, of course, lots of men started writing in turn and realised that actually, you know, this isn't actually, this isn't so much about sort of gender difference. So I'm really interested, and, um, I, and my work as an addictions counsellor changed. My wife's a family therapist, so you can imagine what a difficulty that is. And uh, she sort of introduced me a lot to, uh, because she's not in the, in the addictions field, to sort of systemic thinking, and I, ha I have a systemic supervisor, and starting to think too about, because recovery is so often an individual thing, isn't it? It's about taking personal responsibility. You know, we know, the one thing people in recovery know is that victims don't recover. 
you know, if you're going to get well, you're going to have to really own your stuff. You're going to really have to take responsibility. So actually, it's quite difficult when you start introducing notions of systemic thinking, meaning that actually the idea, and I'll talk about it a bit later, that the couple, that actually one partner in the couple might actually hold the distress that actually both of them have. And that maybe that that's a way that they can function, that one of them can be seen as the distressed one and the other one can be seen as okay. So this is the first time I've done this talk, so I have some anxiety too about doing it. It's going to be a, it's a, a bit like, see, I've already departed from my notes and it's a bit of a standout routine. <laughs> I'm hoping that uh, I am going to. I'm holding my notes in my hand because I'm just going to have to come back to them. I'm sure. I'm hoping they might edit that bit out so it just looks really smooth, you know, and everything as I as I do it all. I'm also hoping that I don't enter that sort of one of those trauma states where brain reduced to size of P can't remember anything, and I do a runner and you're left here <laughs> thinking what's happening. Or the other one, as you probably know, with trauma, that one of the things about trauma is it actually closes down the part of the brain that mediates time. So actually, I could be quite capable of sitting here and talking in two hours' time, thinking I've only just started. So um, we'll see, sort of see what happens. But um, what I'm going to talk about, I want to talk about three. I want to talk about the couple relationship in general, because it applies to everybody, whether they're in recovery or not. I want to talk about the couple relationship in general. I want to talk about the particular difficulties for people in recovery who are in a couple relationship. And... Um, and I think rather importantly, um, I want to talk about how on earth, you know, how can people, how can we negotiate our way through this sort of minefield? You know, because it is. And I think there really are particular difficulties. Now, traditionally, when we talked about the couple relationship, we talked about marriage. We talked about a heterosexual marriage, didn't we? We talked about a marriage that would probably last forever. We talked about one sexual partner for life. Well, you know, this is, um, things have really changed. People marry, they divorce, they remarry, they cohabit, they form couple relationships where they live separately, they do it in straight, gay, bisexual, transgendered relationships. You know, it's a, it's, it's a really colourful field, there's no doubt about that. So that, that, you know, so traditionally that's what's happened. Traditionally, too, coupling was very much, you know, it, the, the notion of falling in love was very much... Um, is, is more of a sort of Victorian idea. You know, I guess, you know, these guys who probably took a bit too much opium and started writing poems because they had nothing else to do, you know, about their partners. It's a very much Victorian idea. I mean, coupling up actually traditionally is about, you know, it's about property and lineage. You know, people coupled up because, you know, actually they wanted to know that the children were theirs. You know, it was a very male, you know, male-dominated society in which men needed to know that children were theirs and they needed to know if the children were theirs, who was going to inherit the cow? You know, it was like, it was about keeping things safe. You know, it was about chastity belts. Do you know, it was all about, so things have, you know, things have really, really changed. Today, you know, it's, it, you know, it's, it's everything, in a sense, to do with love. And, and I think that's complicated, because actually people form couple relationships and what they want, we want you know, they, we want security, you know, we want status, we want, ch we want children, we want responsibility. But we also want, you know, we want excitement and we want adventure. We want a best friend. We want a passionate lover, you know. So we ask an awful lot because I think traditionally those things were separated. I think those things were separated. So it, that's quite a conflict. And I'll talk about that a bit later because actually, you know, well, they are in conflict, those two things. Now, many people have theorised about relationships, the psychologists, the anthropologists, the, you know, the social scientists, about, you know, what it's all about. We do know, we know quite a bit now about relations. We know in the UK and the US that nearly, and you will know all this anyway, that nearly 50% of, of married couples will divorce. It's very hard to get data on couples who aren't married, unfortunately. But we know that nearly 50% um, of couples will divorce. What interestingly we also know is that actually 50% uh, of the couples that separate, that divorce, separate within seven years. Now, what is also interesting, Helen Fisher, the American um, anthropologist, she looked at the data from 60 different countries and realised that divorce peaks at four years which is quite interesting. And what she suggests is that actually, back there on the savannah, actually it took four years to wean the child. You know, he needed to stay around 
you know, in order to guard the cave until it was safe enough, till the child was weaned and actually they could be a bit more independent and then he would move on. I think that's quite an interesting idea. Um, there certainly ought to be an explanation for why in 60 different countries that's the, that's the case. So the anthropologists have had quite a good time, you know, with all of that. Um, we also know, you know, we know that things like smell um, play an enormous part in, in us choosing who we're attracted to. And when you talk to people that are falling in love, you know, they often talk about, I just love a smell, I love his smell. And it's not the perfume, or it might be the mixture of that with the body odour. But, you know, we know that that's the case. And we also know there's a lot of sense. And you may know, in the 1970s, the University of Bern, um, they started to do some experiments about all of this. Do you know about the T-shirt experiments? Have any of you heard about them? Anyway, they're quite savoury. I'll tell you why. Um, Basically, we have in all our, th there is a gene called the MHC gene. It's the major histocompatibility complex. Don't have to really remember that, except it is the gene that actually pretty much runs our immune system. It's the gene that we have that when something comes in, you know, from outside, you know, to attack us as an illness, it's the gene that fights against that. Okay? It's the same gene that unfortunately also rejects when you have transplants and things like that. It's the same gene that really can fuck that up too because, oh, it's not mine, you know, take it away. But it's a really important gene because actually, you know, in the, all of us in our DNA have a flaw. You know, we just do, there are flaws. So what these guys, what these guys in, in the University of Bern, of Bern were trying to find out was like, actually, how do we select for all of that? You know, so what, what happens? Who do we choose? So they were testing and typing um, all these students, these uh, you know, students at the university for their MHC genes. And what they discovered was, and I'll tell you how they discovered it, was that actually people were choosing as a mate, people were fancying and choosing as a mate in terms of smell, people who had dissimilar MHC genes. What that meant was that if you actually had children, these two dissimilar sets of MHC genes would get together and you would have better immunity. I think mean, that's quite fascinating. And they were doing that through smell. And the... Pre uh, and the um, I'll tell you about the experiment because I think it's rather funny, actually. The experiment that they were doing, they asked all these guys and, and, and girls to wear a cotton T-shirt for 48 hours. So, savoury, OK? <laughs> sleep in it, wear this t-shirt all the time, no perfume, no spicy food, just sleep in the t-shirt. They then asked them, uh, on a blind test, to sniff these t-shirts that are all in a jar, you know, take the top off, have a sniff, and rate them in order of preference, okay? But what is fascinating about this experiment is that they rated the ones they preferred were the ones who had the most dissimilar MHC genes. So, you know, we know that this is, you know, who we choose to get together with. This is multifactorial. It's not all about mum and dad. I think a lot of it is, and I shall go on and talk about that because that's my field. But I am really interested in that. I think, you know, things like that seem, seem really fascinating. We know, actually, too, that people uh, mate with, with people within their tribe. I say tribe because, actually, it's not a cultural thing anymore. You know, we tend to sort of choose partners who we sort of work with, went to school with. The, the people who we sort of hung out with, we very rarely go outside of the tribe. We tend to choose partners who have pretty much the same sort of intelligence as us. But we do know that, actually, there are all sorts of unconscious processes. Robin Skinner, um, who the, the sort of the grandfather, he's not alive anymore, but is the grandfather of family therapy, systemic family therapy. He had this quite interesting um, experiment that he did with all his students on right at the beginning of the family therapy training. And he got these guys together who'd never actually... So they're all there in the room getting together for the first sort of welcoming session. They haven't met before. A couple of them might have just had a little chat, but they didn't know each other. And he asked them straight away, don't, I don't really want you talking to each other. I want you to move around the room, just look at each other, just have a you know, gaze upon each other, just, just sort of hang, move on. And I want you to then form a group, put a hand on a shoulder of someone that you sort of feel like might be your sort of person. Okay? So what you end up with is a bunch of groups of people with their hands on the shoulders. Okay? You also end